Right, guys, um, what we're going to do here is just look at this uh, presentation on the composition of Ondarche's work. And I'll sort of focus that first slide uh, just on composition and Ondarche because I think in critical study, what you need to really focus on is him as the author um, and what he does in his composition. Okay, and composition could be a range of different things. So it's not going to just be technique, um, it's going to be the structure of his text uh, and just anything that he does intentionally to create meaning. So the first thing is um, that I think that you might want to refer to or might want to write about is the fact that it's a postmodern text. Um, more than that, I guess the thing that's probably really pertinent in this particular text is this stream of consciousness. A few of you guys are looking at the idea of meta language, uh, and I've done a bit more reading on that and that seems like a good idea as well. Um, but the idea of stream of consciousness is that it's more how the mind thinks rather than um, the idea of chron chronology, which is how we generally write. Okay, so the first point is essentially that, that it's nonlinear, um, so it doesn't sort of rely on a chronological order. And the nonlinear sort of aspect of it to me sort of reflects more that stream of consciousness that you dart from one idea to another depending on how, um, you know, how your sort of mind works. Another thing that I think is interesting is that um, the novel starts at the end, um, which is like, you know, probably a, a gain, um, a little bit more of a postmodern technique. Um, but even even if you don't sort of write it in this area, it's, it's still a, a different way that he composes his text. So uh, the quote there, she listens to the man as he picks up and brings together various corners of the story, attempting to carry it all in his arms. is a beautiful quote. Uh, and she, listening to the man, she is Hannah, um, Alice's daughter, and the man is uh, Patrick, and they're actually driving to pick up Clara, which essentially happens at the end of the text. So um, there's that cyclical nature um, you know, in, in the way that it's structured. Then we've got this other idea of um, you know, the John Berger quote, and here I've made the point that uh, Andache you know, sort of looks at the idea of these fragments of stories that when they're weaved together, and when you put them together, there's a whole. Um, and without them all, uh, it's not a story, okay? Uh, it's, it's part. So the idea that there's multiple streams or multiple ideas, uh, multiple characters, multiple storylines, and that they are blended together to create the whole story uh, sort of confirms the John Berger quote that um, you can't have a single story as if it's the only one because there's obviously more. And, he makes you know that really conscious when he when he writes different paragraphs like the bridge, where Patrick's essentially not even in it. Um, that Patrick's not the story. Patrick's probably the protagonist. Okay, he's probably the most essential character in the text, but he's not the he's not the only part of the story uh, that is of, of relevance and importance. Then we've got the uh, idea of um, how that quote is sort of respected by Andache because he, he writes so much to it. And, and I think by the end of the presentation, you'll see that there's many times where we can look back and go, yes, that, that reflects back um, you know, to the John Berger quote. So he really pays homage to it and respects the epigraph that he's included. We'll probably find that about the epic of Gilgamesh as well. The stream of consciousness uh, is a way of Ondarche's text being a greater reflection of the inner workings of the human mind. So that, I guess, uh, is the point that, that you know, the, the postmodern stream of consciousness means. The fact that there's less rules uh, in the postmodern sort of uh, world uh, allows, um, you know, even Ondarche, and this really isn't in the presentation, but it allows him to write um, a novel in essentially poetic form. And his writing is very poetic. Um, but it's not a poem, so it's definitely a like a piece of prose, uh, definitely a novel, um, but it's very poetic at the same time. So basically, there are no rules. So anything that you pick up in the text that you go, that seems strange or it seems unusual, that's probably where you could refer to postmodernism um, and then make comment on the effect of that. So no matter what, if you're going to use any of this, you're really looking to say, this is, this is why it gives Andache freedom uh, to, to you know, sort of write them in the manner that he wishes. And when he's got that freedom, this is the purpose of it. Okay, so this is why he intentionally uses this freedom in this particular way. And there's a few ideas on that slide about that. The narrative voice is obviously uh, another thing that um, Andache sort of intentionally shifts and transforms. Uh, and he transitions from different um, you know, sort of narrative voices to, to another. Again, you know, you could even sort of bring this back into the idea of, um, you know, the, the postmodern text, okay, because it's, it's an unusual narrative voice, not one I've personally read before in, in another text. So going to the, the sort of two dot points here, 
Um, most of the, or not most, a lot of the text is written with this omniscient sort of third person narration. Um, so we don't know who that character is. They're not essentially a character in the text, but they see everything. Um, so uh, it's an interesting choice because generally speaking, sometimes even in a third person uh, narrative, the person is a character in the text or someone that we can sort of later find out and go, oh, that's them. Uh, but this person seems to be, yeah, totally, um, you know, totally um, ambiguous. Uh, and I think Ondaatje does that in, on purpose because it's like, um, it's like that sort of narrative voice just sort of sitting above them and, and watching them and shedding light on their lives. Um, but the reality that they're important enough to have a narrator, um, it's sort of like secret business almost. And, and this is essentially the purpose of the text that he wants to illustrate the, you know, the contribution that these people made to, you know, uh, you know, industrialized sort of Toronto. So he does this with intention, um, because it is like, you know, it's almost like where, we're strangers or we're, we're you know, visitors to this world. Uh, it's not a world we live in. Um, so I think the, the, um, that omniscient uh, sort of third person works for him. The tense of the novel is also inconsistent. Um, so sometimes he writes in present tense, uh, other times he writes in past tense. Um, but again, if you're gonna make an identification of that uh, in, in your quotation or in, in his writing, all you need to do is say why. So here's a, a good one where um, the passage at the end of the novel Patrick and Caravaggio and Giannetta are on the boat. They chloroform um, you know, the husband and wife. They take the boat off them um, and you know, Patrick and Caravaggio essentially get to the waterworks and Patrick swims in. It's all in present tense because it's an urgent moment in the, in the novel. It's, um, it builds the, builds the pace of, of that sort of writing by making it in present tense. Uh, and same in past tense, I guess you know you could you could sort of identify something there, and you could sort of say how it's looking um, you know, into the significance of of memories or of childhood, and that's why the past tense is used in those sort of ideas. So, depending on his purpose and his intention and what he's trying to achieve, he changes the tense as he sees fit for what he's trying to achieve. Trust me when I say on Darche knows how to use tense. He's not making mistakes, he does it on purpose, okay, to, to illustrate or convey his ideas. So the narrative structure, I guess, is another one that uh, to me is um, interesting uh, because it, it's, again, intentional uh, and it's, again, again, not a structure I've probably seen before, uh, particularly in terms of the, the shift away from a certain character like Patrick. So um, I read a little bit of work uh, about the idea that this text uh, reflects the idea of cubism. Um, it's something John Burge has written a, a little bit about, uh, and people believe that there is a, a sense of that in this novel. Uh, and you see the quote in the last sort of dot point, um, the story is not unique, but multiple, and bringing together its various corners is a cubist approach to a multifaceted, multifaceted world. So the idea of cubism is essentially in the epigraph of um, you know, not being able to tell a story uh, in in the, in the singular, the idea of cubism is that you need that three, all right? You need you need to reflect these three different points to be able to get sort of truth. Um, three, maybe four, maybe you know what I mean. It just depends on on whatever it is that you're looking for. But cubism tends to have this sort of sort of you know this number three in it, um, you, know, you know, in its essence. So if you know, do if you wanted to sort of talk about this, obviously it would require a little bit of um, you know sort of research into cubism, uh, better understanding than I'll, I'll probably give you just then, but uh, the idea is there. Um, and, and, you know, you've got a quote from a, a critic uh, sort of basically saying that that's how she feels the text is. Um, so in that, uh, to reflect that cubism and also, I guess, to reflect the, the initial quote by, by Berger, uh, you've got the idea of different stories. So Little Seeds is obviously you know, the story of um, Patrick's childhood and, um, you know, appropriately named uh, the little um, sort of seeds that grow into his life. Um, the bridge, which is a total uh, departure from Patrick's life, it's really focused on Nicholas uh, Timulkov and it's um, you know, where we get introduced to the nun who falls off the bridge, who we later find out to be uh, Alice. And then Patrick comes back in and he's the searcher. And the searcher uh, essentially uh, is a job that he takes to look for uh, Ambrose Small. Uh, and in doing so, uh, we then are connected with Clara and then reconnected with Alice. Um, so. There's a, a, again, a bit of a cycle there um, of how the characters come back. So Alice sort of on the bridge um, becomes the link 
uh, back to to um, Patrick, okay, because he meets her when he meets Clara. And once we sort of realise that she's the nun, we can sort of then see the significance of the bridge because that's part of her story. And then, of course, when we get into uh, the idea of remorse, um, we get we get the sense, obviously, of um, Nicholas coming back uh, and Nicholas coming back to basically look after Hannah. Okay, so we've got a, a real sort of, there's a link between all of these things um, and that sort of, it gives us that cubist sort of sense uh, that all things are connected, uh, but there's, that they're not, there's not one thing, that there's multiple things. Uh, and it also gives you the idea of that initial epigraph uh, by Berger. So then we go into book two um, and we've got Palace of Purification and Remorse. Um, so the Palace of Pur Purification, um, obviously metaphorical, um, you know, in, in terms of the sense that that, you know, sort of chapter um, you know, builds uh, Patrick, I guess, to some and, and purifies him and makes him whole again. And essentially a lot of it is um, about his reattachment to Alice. Uh, so that sort of makes sense. Uh, and then remorse, obviously, um, how guilty he feels uh, about Alice's death. And to be honest, I don't think we've fully comprehended that um, remorse and why he sort of reacted so poorly until we found out maybe his role or, or maybe his blame of himself, um, you know, in, in terms of what he sort of did uh, or contributed to in terms of Alice's death. Uh, so we get the idea that his remorse is multifaceted, okay? So obviously his remorseful um, that he ever made that bomb, um, I guess, and he's probably remorseful that he ever like, left it in, in their apartment and I guess he's very remorseful that she picked it up and it exploded and killed her. Um, so, yeah, it's not like... Um, it's not clear, I guess, until, you know, towards the end of the chapter that we see why he's remorseful, okay, and why he's sort of uh, potentially, you know, like, you know, impacted by her death um, on a very personal level because of his role in it. Um, obviously, he's impacted because he loved her, but, um, you know, the nature of her death, I think, you know, has a, a, an even deeper impact on him. Um, even, I, I guess, you know, if, if I was interpreting it, I'd say maybe the remorse is a little bit to do with the fact that, that when he... Um, when he commits the crime, that he essentially knows what he's doing, and by doing that, he knows that he's going to uh, leave Hannah in a, you know, in a situation that he won't be able to look after. He's going to have to let Nicholas, but he trusts Nicholas, uh, and in a sense, you know, he's happy for that to happen. Uh, book three goes on, and when we start with Caravaggio, um, again, Nicholas is the link, okay, because obviously Nicholas is in jail with him. But the story becomes very focused on Caravaggio there. Uh, and again, we get this idea that, that this is one of the, the stories within the story um, that make it up. And when we get to Maritime Theatre where Caravaggio and Patrick reconnect, uh, we sort of then again sort of see why Caravaggio was of such importance in the previous chapter because he becomes such a key character um, in terms of allowing Patrick to essentially you know, plot his plan uh, against Harris and the waterworks. Then we get to the Maritime Theatre um, and obviously we've got the, the sense of the fact that the immigrants did actually have a theatre uh, in the waterworks, um, you know, unbeknownst to Harris and probably unbeknownst to anybody. Uh, but obviously the, the, the aqua sort of sense of it is, is the theatre of him trying to get in uh, to the waterworks um, and the maritime, obviously the water um, you know, and around the docks, uh, trying to sort of actually ex you know, explode it, uh, you know, get his sense of justice. Okay, so... The idea, I guess, if, if we're going to look at this narrative structure is that you could look at the title of any of those um, chapters and reflect on what they mean. Like I said uh, in class, I feel like the searcher might have a deeper meaning. I don't think it's just about searching like for Ambrose Small. I feel like the searcher is um, Patrick searching for his identity, searching for an understanding of what's important in his life. Uh, I feel like it's a bit of a deeper sort of title. So you could comment on those titles uh, and comment on why Ondarche sort of gives them those titles. So I think they've all got some significance and some meanings. Even the bridge, um, metaphorically, is the connection between two things. Uh, and the connection between two things here is Nicholas and Alice. So all of them are quite clever uh, in the way that Ondarche sort of uh, titled them. He's got the three books uh, to sort of separate our uh, time at, uh, uh, as such, because sometimes you know there is uh, a, devoid, a divide of time between the, the two books, or like particularly between, I think, uh, book one and book two, um, sort of skip eight years almost uh, in terms of what's happening. We don't ever get that context. Um, but also in terms of the cubism of, of different stories and, and obviously the, the epigraph at the start. 
Then we've got uh, this symbolism, um, and you know I'll actually even later on call this intertextuality. The Epic of Gilgamesh is um, you know really really pertinent in the text. So it's interwoven. It's part of the text. So it's not just the epigraph. And I feel like John Berger is. It's not just the epigraph either. It's it's actually embedded into the text. Um, so the title, obviously itself of the novel, uh, is from this epic in the skin of a lion and. Um, we get to this point where um, the explicit sort of uh, explanation of it in the text is that um, they're doing this play and each person had their moment. They assumed the skins of wild animals when they took responsibility for the story. And I guess in essence, um, that's reflected in Ondaatje's you know, narrative structure. Different people take um, pertinence in the, in the novel at different times. So like we just said, chapter two, it's, it's really Nicholas. Um, in book, book three, in the first chapter there, it's, it's Caravaggio. So depending on um, who sort of is the most important, they, they assume the skin of the wild animal. They become responsible. And uh, in essence, Alice, uh, when she dies, Patrick needs to shed his skin. He needs to get rid of it and become himself again or become a different version of himself. Um, and he does try to take responsibility for the story. He becomes the story when he attacks the waterworks. And even at the start of that uh, chapter, essentially the story is more Caravaggio and, and him seducing this wife. Um, you know, to get access to the to the ship, um, but the reality is, um, at that point, once once the chloroform forming is done, then Patrick takes over and he takes responsibility for the narrative um, of, of the rest of the story. And uh, I guess you know you can see that it's different characters who take responsibility at, at different times. Uh, and even at the end, I think like the fact that Clara rings um, Patrick and asks to be picked up and basically saved in, in a really you know sort of cliched way, uh, when he goes to pick her up, he goes, you know, he directs um, and, and he has the responsibility of the story. That is not something that would be consistent with the rest of the novel, particularly in, in relation to Clara and Patrick's uh, relationship. She always uh, took responsibility in their relationship. So this is the first time I guess Patrick does uh, and he's in charge and in control. Uh, she relies on him at this point. Obviously, too, there's uh, lots of different parallels that you can uh, draw between the epic and the novel. Um, you know, I think I read one, uh, I might mention it later on, about um, in the inner textuality that the story of, in the epic of Gilgamesh is that um, the wild sort of man was, was tamed by having sex with um, you know, this uh, you know, sort of goddess uh, and she basically makes him better. Uh, and it's sort of the the manner in which um, you know, sexual intimacy or, or sexual connection can cleanse, uh, can, can you know, uh, develop or, or you know, progress a man. Um, so Patrick goes through those same things uh, and we can draw those parallels. So when you're looking at the epic, um, you can look at lots of different aspects, lots of stuff on the internet that you can look at. Um, there's lots of parallels being drawn. Um, so many that you can't mention them all, but I, I would imagine that it's very difficult to write your response without mentioning the Epic of Gilgamesh at some point, okay, because it's in the text title and there's certainly parallels to be drawn between the two ideas. Um, and I think I shared a, an article with you that essentially sort of went through some of those, so you might go back and have a look at that. There's a lot of juxtaposition or a lot of contrast in the text. Um, and I, I've just mentioned three there, like light and dark, uh, natural you know, the natural world and the synthetic world, and essentially that is the country and the city. Um, but again, if you're going to talk about these contrasts, you need to look at the thematic ideas. I think in class the other day we sort of made the observation that the light and dark could essentially, you know, be reflective of the ruling class and the working poor, um, and, you know, the contrast between them. Um, and to me, too, like I thought of another idea that um, the contrast sort of reflects the contrast between people. We've got you know, people who are open and honest, and I would say to some extent Patrick's probably the most open and honest, compared to those who are closed and secretive, which essentially Alice would fall into that sort of situation. So again, if we're going to talk about contrast uh, between two things, we really need to make sure we, we establish what it is that that contrast uh, does and why Andache does that um, in terms of his purpose or in, ter in terms of the ideas that he wants to present. Um, so there's lots of different ones that you can look at um, and it's up to you how you look at these sort of contrasts. Uh, light and dark is obviously probably a pretty obvious one that, that, that would be um, easy to identify, but it's more difficult to talk about the effect of it. And that in the end is probably what's going to get you your personal voice, your, your idea of the text uh, is what you think the effect is. 
I spoke a little bit about the olfactory sense throughout the text, um, and there's so many references to, to the sense of smell, um, more, more so than probably the other senses, but there's definitely the other senses as well, hearing and uh, seeing, and um, I think, you, I guess you've got to like sort of go to yourself, well, why does he highlight smell more than the others? So here's my ideas. Um, the idea that the smells of the work become a part of them, um, it, it's almost like they can't avoid it. It's just become a part, it's seeped into them. Uh, it becomes who they are, like I said, the, the fabric of their being. Um, when you get to this point, like you sort of say, well, why, why does he want to show that? Why does he want to say that this smell becomes a part of their, their sort of everyday uh, sense of self? It's like in their skin. Uh, to me, it's uh, like, you know, they can't escape that work. Uh, the work is part of them. And even after they pass away, the remnants of their work is there. So, you know, like I said, the bridge, um, you know, the waterworks, they, they still exist um, in Toronto because of the, the sacrifice, the, the blood, the sweat, the tears that, that those migrant workers put into it. Um, so as much as their work becomes a part of them, they become a part of the history of Toronto then. So to me, it's like, um, you know, and this isn't in the text, so this is just my sense um, that that I think Ondarche would feel like you could go to these places, you can smell, um, you know, the, the men that work there, um, that that they that they almost have this like sort of ghost like, um, you know, sort of presence in, in these in these sort of you know big public works that they were a part of. A um, few motifs um, that are in uh, the text, uh, and again you've got to sort of say, well, what, what do they mean? So uh, the stone um, is sort of mentioned not too much, but you know, definitely there's a, a section where I think Alice sort of talks about Patrick having a stone in his mouth and that stone's like a barrier to Patrick, like you can't sort of break through and get into him, which um, to me sort of is like something obviously on Darche is trying to sort of establish, but the reality is I think that um, you know, Patrick, more than other characters, is able to sort of, expose himself but the stone definitely you know in that particular scene represents that um there's a lot of references to moths um and i thought to myself well some caterpillars turn into moths and some turn into butterflies um but the moths aren't really as attractive um you know or aren't as pretty um but they're pretty much the same they come from the same area now i think the moths could could be you know so you could draw a parallel to the immigrant workers you could draw a parallel to patrick um, but there's definitely a lot of a lot of ideas around the moths that you could could use. Um, the sexual intimacy, like I said, the link to the Epic of Gilgamesh that I mentioned before, the sex with the goddess. Um, but the idea of sexual intimacy and the way that that's used, particularly I think in the thematic idea of power um, in, a, in a relationship, how um, Clara and Alice, um, you know, both use this dynamic sense of power and two as female sort of, um, you know, sort of, characters they they have a, a power over Patrick um, which is you know again a unique sort of way of writing generally speaking men have the power over women in, in most literature but you know I think um, Darche has really flipped it here um, and the idea that that um, that sexual intimacy can come in different formats okay so obviously you know we read through some of those sections and made comment about the animalistic or the, the rawness of some of those um, intimate moments um, and how that sort of, you know, represents maybe more a bestial lust than, than, a, than a love, um, but that it has a role uh, in, in the text or it has a role in life. Um, so it's an interesting you know, sort of examination for Mondace. Again, the sexual intimacy is not something he put there by accident. He's too good a writer to, to need that sort of gratuitous sort of um, you know, imagery in his text. For him, there's a real pertinence to how he uses it. Not to me, I really think it's about the power and in, in relationships and the, the manner in which um, you know people are trying to use different aspects of a relationship to to you know increase their dominance or increase their sort of um, their sense of worth for themselves. Um, yeah, and different needs of different people. Okay, certainly Clara needs different things to Alice. Patrick needs different things to Ambrose. Um, and again, I think when we talk about this, when we talk about Clara's power over um, Patrick, we also see Ambrose's power over Clara. So there's this idea of power, I think, is maybe a, an interesting thematic idea that you could look at. The last one, the iguana, uh, and the iguana being a chameleon, and then there's like you know quite significant references to Patrick being a chameleon as well, that he fits in, he, he adapts and he adjusts to, to the world around him. So 
I feel like there's these things, these motifs that are used, um, I feel like they have meaning uh, in terms of the effect that you might like to comment on. Um, the inner textuality here, I've just listed them. Um, you're going to need to go through, obviously, you know, there's a bit of repetition here with the Epic of Gilgamesh and the quote by John Berger, but they're at the start um, and they are the first sort of sense of intertextuality. And essentially, in case you're not sure what intertextuality is, uh, it's just when you use a, 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 an already established text within your text. So people are uh, generally speaking, and I say that because, you know, I don't know many of these things, but they might be knowledgeable of that, uh, you know, other text and that allows for the author to make a different comment because of, of you know, that sort of relevance. Even if it's not, um, obviously for people like us who are studying the text, we can find those links. Uh, and, then that, and then it adds, I think, to the writing. It adds to Abdache's um, you know, brilliance as a writer and the manner in which he does it, but also adds depth to his ideas once we understand these things. So from three on, uh, the letters of Joseph Conrad are referred to by Alice. Um, there's this story, Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso, that's um, you know, mentioned within the text. Lewis Hine is the photographer that I mentioned um, in New York, um, and he, he was more an authentic photographer. Photo. He took photos of the immigrant workers as they were. Uh, there's a song, I Can't Get Started, by Ira Gershwin that's referred to in the text, um, and this other story, King Solomon's Mines. Now, you don't need to look at these. I think there's another reference to some biblical references that you could use um, that I think we mentioned. And I said, I think I said you in past. Look, I don't know what they mean, but they could be of interest. You're not going to be able to write about all of these things, but if you could find something that you thought was relevant here, uh, I don't think too many kids would be writing about this. So again, this might give you that personal voice, but it's going to require a little bit of research before you're going to be able to get to that point. So essentially, I guess you can see that there's a lot of different ideas. And even as I'm sort of speaking to you there, I can see as compared to other texts that we've done where I've sort of gone through compositional sort of ideas, even within this, everything's linked, everything's interrelated. And I, I think when I'm explaining it, I can even feel like it's complicated. So when you're hearing it, you're probably going, oh, what's he actually talking about right now? So what I think you've got to do is when you start to pick, well, which are the which are the compositional ideas that I'm going to put into my analysis, that you've got to look at the ones that connect ideas from one to the other. Because obviously when we start to get into the writing uh, of the essay next lesson, what we're going to look at is how does how do, does uh, an answer that like these these model answers, how do they connect two ideas together? Because generally speaking, we'd have like our ideas, if you know what I mean, uh, in the module, but we've got none of those. So essentially our ideas are gonna come from the text itself, the question that's asked, and connecting them through things that are naturally connected in the text. So once we talk about this, it naturally progresses into a conversation about this, and that'll be able to give us our logical sequence. So that's something we're gonna to have to work on uh, once we get to that point. All right, so hopefully this has been of some help. Like our, I understand it's probably a little bit complicated, but you don't need to pick everything that I've discussed, just the things that you think are of relevance. I'll also share this um, with you so that when you've got the video, um, and you can just listen over and you, you'll have the, the, um, the slides as well. Thanks.